here. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, speaking of, of Daniel 11, it, it records events in such great detail and so accurately when you compare them to what did unfold between the fall of the of Greece and the Maccabean revolt that the, the description is so accurate that um, many scholars reject it as original. Like, oh, Daniel couldn't have written it. There's no way. And the reason, because, because it's so accurate, it must have been written after the events took place. And so I... In studying books of the Old Testament and tabs, you'll see this uh, um, with OTI. Is they'll they'll talk about this most likely um, that Daniel sort of been the most attacked book as far as authenticity um, and authorship. I think for that very reason, because the prophecy was so accurate. As of course. Know, if it's from God, it's hundred percent accurate. But you know, having written down on the specific details, it really shows the sovereignty of God. And these liberal scholars don't want to acknowledge that, or acknowledge, uh, you know, that that future events could be predicted that way. So, in fact, I have a whole book. Uh, oh. I had it. Oh, I must have borrowed it. Um, oh, no, here we go. This is a really helpful resource. If you're studying Daniel, it's called Studies in the Book of Daniel by um, Dick Wilson. And uh, he does an excellent job. This is an older work. It's a classic. I think it was... Well, when did he write this? 1917. All right. But he addresses like all of the attacks. So back even like this was basically the late 19th century, uh, late 1800s, when all these attacks were against the Daniel, the book, the authenticity of it, the veracity of it, uh, authorship and all of that. And so he really put together a an excellent response to to those things. But but just going back to Robbie's point that, yeah, to be able to describe in such detail those events really displays God's sovereignty over the affairs of man. And I think that's something that the original audience would have taken away from that as they see being described in very specific detail. You know, that could give them confidence as well that God's going to carry out the plan. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And so it would serve as a means of building their faith, serve as a means of supporting the, the main idea of God's sovereignty over, over kingdoms. Um, and then we can look back at something like that as a confidence to, for us in the word of God. And it's, it's truthfulness, it's validity. Because we know Daniel, that book of Daniel was written before before those events mm -hmm. took place. And uh, Dick Wilson really makes a good case for that um, in his studies. So that's one thing, you know, people ask you, if they're struggling with confidence in the word. Of course, the Holy Spirit is the one in the end who's going to bring that confidence and faith. But, but sometimes the means in which he does that will be through, you know, showing people, look, these events happen. If you look in history, and they were these events were predicted hundreds of years before they happened. Daniel wrote that you know, five, what five, uh, uh, twenty BC, five thirty, sorry, five thirty-five BC, somewhere around there, and then it happened around one seventy-five BC, I think, is when the Antioch Epiphany. So what what is that? 360 years so good anything else any other thoughts 
Um, Jim? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'm looking at Daniel 12 um, and looking for that reference to the resurrection, you said? There was yeah. a... Um, yeah, just... just verse 2. Interest. Sure, let me... Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. How did I miss that? Yeah. At that time, Michael the Prince, who stands guard, will be a time mm. of distress. Such has never happened. What is that, fellas? <laughs> right? Mm. Time of distress. Uh, the great tribulations. At that oh, time, your is. people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. Mm. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but others to reproach everlasting contempt. Now, here's another example of mountain peaks, by the way, guys, um, mm. in verse 2. Notice it mentions a physical resurrection. And it mentions some will be resurrected to everlasting life, but others to uh, reproach everlasting contempt. And uh, so it sounds like, so some would say, ah, see, those two events take place at the same time. Okay, but I don't, Daniel wasn't, again, don't, you can't get hung up all the time on, okay, these are sequence of events. He's just telling us the events. And there's a mountain peak here. The resurrection of those to eternal life, speaking of believers, that happens at the rapture. And then a, oops, it caught my hand. And then, um, in Revelation 20, the martyred saints. But the those who are be resurrected to judgment, that happens at the end of the millennial kingdom. Mm. Okay? So there's a thousand-year separation, even though verse 2 makes it sound like it happens at the same time. Mm. But just because he mentions those two events together doesn't mean he's saying that they're going to happen at the same time. Just like he can say, just like Isaiah can say in Isaiah 9, 6, a child will be born to us and the government will rest on his shoulders. Well, those two events didn't happen at the exact same time. The first one happened at his birth. The second one still is yet to happen. Uh, in a real literal physical sense. So, uh, same thing here in Daniel 2. So, we see the evidence of a physical resurrection being described of the believers and unbelievers. But just keep in mind, because we have additional revelation from the book of Revelation, but also from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, we recognize there's the the, re, the the resurrection of believers is different, takes place at a different time than unbelievers, separated by more than a thousand years. All right. Okay. Any other questions? So, from our discussion of Matthew, um, we see this sort of timeline that Jesus provides us. In this case, we do see a sequence of events because he describes it that way. And we can understand because of knowing Daniel's 70th seven, that it's a seven year period, middle of that period, the abomination of desolation. So we, we do have specifics and details regarding timing in that particular, uh, in those two particular passages that the second coming is preceded by this great tribulation of three and a half years, which is initiated by an abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of, which he said would happen in the middle of the seven-year period. And Daniel also indicated that the beginning of this 70th seven or seven-year period would be inaugurated by the treaty of the prince with, with the people of Israel. Okay? So if I were to sort of highlight these 
these particular events are the ones described by Daniel and Matt and uh, Jesus in, in the book of Matthew. Okay, the millennial kingdom comes uh, from Revelation and Zechariah 14. Um, okay, so with that, let's take a look at uh, the time we have the key passages and um, regarding the rapture. If you remember, rapture comes from uh, the Latin word rapturo, which we find in the translation of 1 Thessalonians 4.17, a Latin translation. All right. Um, Ence, you want to read this? 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. That we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... We shall always be with the Lord. Okay. And of course, Paul, um, oh, I should have. I'm sorry. Let me give you the whole. I meant for you to read verse 16 as well. I'm going to ask you to read this again in a second. Sorry about this. Sorry. It's okay. okay. Let's try it again. Start from verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive and, and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air so we, sh so we shall always be with the lord yeah, and this, of course, is in response to those who had the mistaken idea that the Christ had already returned. So he's he's telling them, don't 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 uh, be confused by that. And he's describing here what how this is going to take place. And notice he mentions Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, and then the dead will rise first. Dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, an allusion to Daniel. 12. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. So that will be caught up comes from the sure. Greek word harpazo, uh, which just means to be uh, taken up, seized, snatched, um, suddenly removed. It's the idea. And the Latin translation of harpazo is rapturo. All right. And that's where the term rapture comes from, the English word. This comes from the Latin word. Now, there are a few key passages in reference to the rapture. We're going to look at those uh, this week and next week, Lord willing, and kind of glean some principles from them. But, uh, you know, it is, it's agreed among uh, premillennialists, again, those, again, who believe that Christ will return before the millennial kingdom, uh, that the seven-year tribulation, Will come before his return as we just looked at from daniel 9 and matthew 24 but there's a difference of opinion as to when that rapture uh will take place okay some say before the tribulations others say after and then others say somewhere in between so there, there's really four four rapture positions um held among pre-millennials, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture, that the church will be raptured at the beginning of the tribulation. So right at the time or just before this treaty of the prince, the church will be taken up. Uh, the mid-tribulation view is the rapture will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation, which we just read about, you know, the uh, abomination of desolation. And at, at that point, we will be, the church will be taken up. There's a pre-wrath position that's sometime after the midpoint, but before the end. So, because if you look at the sequence of uh, the details of the judgments, right? You have the six seal or seven seals, the seven uh, trumpets, and then the seven bowls, and then sort of this increase in intensity of judgment. And so that the, uh, it won't be right at the mid 
point of the tribulation, but sometime after that, really some think like right before the seven bowls, some would say there's variety of views there, but this pre-wrath position, I think has gotten more popularity than the mid-trib position these days. And I think Manny mentioned that before, even in looking at the three views of the rapture book, uh, the mid-trib guys didn't even get, get a chapter in there. So pre-wrath seems to be a more common among those who think it's somewhere in the middle. And then we have the post-tribulation view, which is the church will be taken up at the second coming, which, by the way, is exactly what all millennial, post-millennial guys would agree with, um, that really the second coming and the rapture happen at the same time. Okay, but there are some premillennials who also hold to that position regarding the rapture the church okay and as i mentioned here the first three options which are the pre mid and pre wrath raptures are held by uh dispensational premillennialists the last option the post trib is held by the historic premillennials amillennials and postmillennials okay remember the historic premillennials are basically uh, the early church fathers um were historic premillennials. They believed that Christ would return before millennial kingdom, but they were also covenantal. Uh, so they had a covenantal view of the scriptures overall. Okay. So we can kind of, you know, sorry, my graphics here aren't, aren't the most stellar, but oops, let me do this. I tried to show this visually. I hope this makes some sense. But you have the, again, looking at the, um, you have the uh, Matthew 24, Daniel 9 chart here. And then if we were to throw the rapture positions on top of it, we'd have the pre-rapture right before tribulation period or ushering in the tribulation period, the mid-wrath, mid um Trib rapture would be at the time of the abomination of desolation. Pre-wrath would be sometime after that. And then the post-tribulation would happen right at the second coming. Okay. So I don't know. I hope this isn't confusing. I'll just try to give you a visual sense of this. There's much better picture. I just didn't have time to go find a more quality one, but this gives a general idea. Okay, so let's um, let's take a look at some key rapture text. We started with this one last time, 1 Corinthians 15. This isn't the first passage that mentions the rapture. That, that title goes to 1 Thessalonians. Um, Paul probably wrote that around 51 or so AD. Um, uh, and uh, Corinthians was probably a few years after that, 1 Corinthians, 55-ish, somewhere in there. So really, in terms of time being written, um, 1 Thessalonians is the uh, pre-4 1 Corinthians 15. But uh, I wanted to cover 1 Corinthians 15 first because some of the insights and details that are mentioned there, I think, are helpful to start with. So. All that said, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start in verse 50. Of course, you remember the context here. This is the resurrection chapter that Paul addresses the, the uh, evidence, the, the fact of the resurrection, and then the reason why the resurrection is important and significant. And then affirming the details of the resurrection, that Christ is the first fruits, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, meaning he's the first fruit of the harvest, meaning there are many resurrections to follow. And then Paul sort of even gives up, gives the summation of human history when he says, Jesus will subject all of his enemies to himself and then hand over kingdom to uh, to the Father, so that God may be all in all. So it's this idea of Paul is summing up human history that 
that Christ will be the fulfillment. Remember that we were looking at the, the what's the, the story of scripture? That Christ is the ruler, um, not only the redeemer, but also the ruler. First Corinthians 15 emphasizes that element that he will he will do what Adam failed to do. He will establish God's righteous reign on earth, um, which is as God intended it from the beginning through Adam. But Adam, of course, sinned. And uh, so the, then we just that began this promise of a coming one who would crush the head of the serpent. And First Corinthians 15 really describes that very thing, that he will subject all things to himself. And that the resurrection is the crucial identification of Jesus as this Messiah who would fulfill God's righteous reign on earth. So that's why the resurrection is such a critical component. It's not just, it's not only important because Jesus said it would happen. So it, it speaks to the integrity and truthfulness of Christ, which is important. But also, if you look at the preaching of the apostles in Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 14, uh, and other places, which refer to the resurrection as a key marker of Christ's lordship as Messiah. That not only does it show the Father accepted Christ's sacrifice, but if you remember in Acts 2, Peter says, God made him Lord and Christ. Proving it through the resurrection. And Paul circles back to that in 1 Corinthians 15 and providing the important, the reason the resurrection is so important is that it identifies Christ as this ruler, this Messiah, who's going to subject all things to himself, which is what God told Adam to do, right? Uh, right? Rule over the earth, he said. Uh, um, um, how did he put it? The word's not coming to me. Have dominion. Yeah, have dominion and what was the other Subdue? thing? Subdue. Thank you. <laughs> I'm having a fade tonight. Um, Subdue. Yeah, have dominion over the earth. So, um, Really, Paul describes that very thing is what Jesus fulfills in 1 Corinthians 15. And he links it to, in the context of, the resurrection. And so this is why resurrection was central to the apostles' gospel message and needs to be central to ours. Not only that it shows Jesus' sacrifice was accepted, but that Jesus is the one who's going to return and, and establish God's righteous reign on earth. And are you going to be his friend who he saves or his enemy who he judges when he comes back? So uh, make sure the resurrection is a key element of you share the gospel with somebody, not only as proof of Jesus, you know, was who he said he was, but that's also his, his uh, proof of his Messiahship, that he's king, that he's the Christ. In any case. So Paul is going through all those elements, aspects of the resurrection. And then he gets to verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, speaking of another element regarding the future. So he spoke in verse 20 of the future of our resurrection. And now here, there's something else that Paul wanted to let them know uh, in reference to these to these. Uh, end times events okay so here we're going to have verses 50 to 58 so i'm going to ask uh, tabs to read 50 to 54 and then um uh, maybe robbie you could read 55 to 58 hmm. okay Basil. first corinthians 15 verse 50 now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the corruptible inherit the incorruptible. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the word that was written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right. Okay, a lot here. But I just want to highlight a couple of things that I think are significant in regards to the rapture. Um, verse 51. What does Paul describe there? Or what does he state uh, or indicate that he's going to reveal or, or now tell them? We look there. It's a mystery. Yeah, notice I tell you a mystery. Um, this is where we left off last time in our discussion. Mm -hmm. A mystery. Now, when Paul uses this word mystery, which he did before in 1 Corinthians 13, and then also he, he used it in Ephesians. He used it in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Ephesians 2. He's talking about the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge. Okay. So speaking of things revealed. And then Ephesians 3. He uses the term mystery. It's used in a few other places too. But notice what he says here, um, speaking of his ministry that God had given him, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. Okay, so how is a mystery made known? It's a uh, Greek word, musterion, mystery. How is it made known? By revelation. By revelation. About which when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which, speaking of the mystery, in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it was now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. How? In the Spirit, or by the Spirit. And then he describes what that mystery is, the Jew and Gentile coming together as one in the church but notice here very clearly mis the mysteries made known by revelation the mystery of christ which was not made known as it was now revealed again by the spirit so these emphasize a mystery is something not able to be determined or figured out by us it has to be made known revealed and there specifically by the spirit okay so this word mystery in the way paul uses it is the idea he uses it later in ephesians chapter 5 when he's speaking of marriage and he says he quotes genesis 2 24 for this cause a reason a man will leave his father and mother cling to his wife and then he says this mystery is great and then he says I'm speaking of Christ in the church. Whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> right? It's like, what? I don't remember seeing that anywhere, that marriage is, is meant to be a picture of Christ in the church. Where did you get that from, Paul? That wasn't in Genesis 2.24. What are you talking about? Well, that's why Paul says it was a mystery. He says it hadn't been known until that very moment when God revealed it. God's intent for marriage to be a picture of Christ and his bride. So there are different things described as a mystery. In Ephesians 3, the mystery was Jew and Gentile coming together in Christ as one in the church. In 1 Corinthians 13, he describes the, the mystery there. 
or he's speaking of uh, mysteries that just in a general sense, those things revealed by God uh, to people like prophecies, words of knowledge. And then now here in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, behold. So now behold, remember that's that exclamation that says, okay, listen up, pay attention now. I'm going to tell you something. So it's kind of a break in the flow as he now inserts this exclamation. says, okay, behold, listen now. I tell you a mystery. Oh, okay. So what follows now is going to be something revealed to Paul by the Spirit that had not been previously known. Okay? That, this is important to understand, this, this point. That's why I'm laboring it right now. Because mm. it's a mystery. The rapture was not something that was known. Now, the bodily resurrection was mentioned, okay, back in Daniel 12. But this idea of the church being caught up, which he's going to describe in a minute, and given that resurrection body while still alive, Mm -hmm. This was not known. This is the mystery that had to be revealed by the Spirit. It could not have been figured out by anybody apart from that. Okay, so with that in mind, this was something not previously known. Now, just as a hint, was the second coming ever brought up before? Is Was the second coming something that was known? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Matthew 24, for example. Zechariah 14 mm. as another example. Um, so, uh, so the second coming of Christ was something known. In fact, Paul even mentioned that a little earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus would subject all things to himself so implied in that is a return to do that so this mystery is something different mm -hmm. than the second coming it's something distinct all right now it could happen at the second coming that's still a potential i'm going to show you later why i don't think that can be the case um but but this event of the church being seized, or, or well, in this case, he didn't use rapture yet, but this, whatever Paul's going to describe here now, is something new, something revealed by God to him. Okay. So let's take a look. It can't, it can't be speaking of the second coming specifically, because that's something already, it's already been revealed. In previous revelation so this is something else that he's about ready to describe here and what does he now say about well here he gives it what is the mystery what else does he say let's just focus on verse 51 for a minute i tell you a mystery okay what is this revelation by the spirit of god that paul has been given that's been revealed to him. Well, first, we will not all sleep. What did he mean by that? How has he used the term sleep earlier in 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 11. We will, we will not die. Yes. Sleep here as a reference, a euphemism for death. So not all believers, because he's saying we here, will not all sleep. Not all believers are going to die, but all will be changed. All right. So not all believers will die, but all believers will experience a, a, a change. Well, what change is that? He's going to tell us in a moment. Okay. How will we be changed? Well, Paul now answers this in a moment. Twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will all be changed, or we will be changed. So he mentions the dead. 
being raised. And then again, though, he says, we will be changed. So the implication is that change that will happen to those who don't die and those who have died is going to take place at this mm. in a moment, twinkling of an eye. I don't remember what the term for twinkling was there. Um, I forgot the Greek. I'll have to, let me take a quick look. What that word twinkling. Rippy. Verse 52, Rippy. yeah. Rippy. How is that used? I just, I can't remember. Let me just look up real quick. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's just the... Uh, yeah. So it's re repay. Repay is the root. The idea of a rapid event. A rapid movement. So yeah, the repay of the eye. Ophthalmos is the eye. So it's literally the the rapid eye. So it's this idea of so twinkling of the eye is probably a good. That's an really an English idiom. A twinkle in your eye is kind of like this little flutter, but it's like a moment, right? It's momentary. Mm -hmm. This event. What is the event? All right. The dead will be raised imperishable. And then he goes into detail of the change that will take place is that the corruptible will put on incorruptible. Mortal put on immortality. Okay, He's, he's speaking of this resurrection body. When this corruptible puts on the incorruptible, the mortal puts on then. So is this idea of... Uh, you know, the, the body is what's corruptible and mortal. It's going to put on the incorruptible. So here he describes in these verses, verses 51 to 53, what this mystery is. That all believers will receive, receive an incorruptible, immortal body. Those who are alive at this sounding of the trumpet and those who are dead. But again, remember, this is a different event than the second coming. Because he opens up with describing this as a mystery. Does that make sense? You guys have any thoughts or questions about that? Now, he doesn't give a bunch of details here. It's really kind of overview. He gives a little bit more detail in 1 Thessalonians, which will... Um, take a look at next time but but here I, I think the important and this is why i wanted to cover it first was how paul introduces it as this mystery but you got any any comments or questions um uh, about about this No, uh, Dr. Tim? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like to be clarified. Uh, ano po ang, well, what's the position of, of uh, Dr. MacArthur regarding the uh, eschatology? Is he, I mean, you know, uh, I'm just confused because I, I heard some some things and I heard another things, you know. Can you enlighten me or perhaps you know the position of the church or or John MacArthur na lang? Yes, he um if you look in his book Biblical Doctrines, he he lays out his view of that um he's dispensational, so he's premillennial and also so he believes in the millennial kingdom that's preceded by the 
tribulation period, and he holds to the view of a pre-tribulation rapture. So he so would pre say pre-trib, pre-mill pre-trib, pre -trib, yeah. pre -trib. Oh. very strongly <laughs> pre-mill <laughs> pre-trib. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you can mm -hmm. you can read the details in uh, in the MacArthur Study Bible. He mentions it here in this passage in First Thessalonians four, and then also in the Biblical Doctrines book. Um, the I was just yeah. reading it not long ago. He, he lays out his mm -hmm. uh, his position there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so the Master Seminary Grace Community Church also hold to that view, as as do I, Taya, that's our TMAI as well, that's our uh, our position on on that. Now, it's interesting, too, I don't know, did you guys notice, again, I, I just like to keep bringing this up just because it's an important hermeneutic as we whenever we interpret prophetic passages because here this is prophetic right in the sense of future events paul's telling us a future event here in these verses but notice what the tone is and what the focus is how does paul wish for us to really apply this what's his tone he's not like saying okay so here i'm laying out this view um you know, no, he's he's speaking of this event because he's he's rejoicing in the defeat of death. Because remember the context here, and I think this is why he brings this particular rapture um, event up, is he's been speaking of the resurrection right through the whole chapter, and then he ends with this this other future event, this mystery that is the. Um, all of us putting on this incorruptible, immortal body. And then notice he does so, he follows us with a declaration of praise. That this event, this putting on of this incorruptible body, being resurrected, right? The Lord's resurrection was the first fruit. And now here he's speaking of... Um, receiving this incorruptible body. And what does this demonstrate? That death is defeated. Sin, the power of sin is defeated. And we have the victory and the, the final sort of uh, proof and reward or result of that is this incorruptible body. And then... Notice application is given. Prophetic, you know, future events, for, for, uh, foretelling always has connected to it an application for the hearers. And what is the application here? Knowing that the resurrection has happened, knowing what Christ is going to do as the first fruit of that resurrection, knowing that as a part of this resurrection, we will receive these incorruptible, immortal bodies, knowing that death has been defeated, sin has been defeated. What are we to do with all that? Have you ever preached this text? Your emphasis is verse 58, brothers. Right. Be steadfast and movable. Why? Because we know what's coming. We know who's won. And we have the description here of, of how the victory is going to take place. And so that should motivate us to endure, to be hardworking, to be fixed, and to be focused on the work of the Lord. And that it's it's not for nothing. This is a mm -hmm. a great motivate motivating um, passage, and and this is why Paul, I think, reveals this mystery as well. It's kind of a if the resurrection wasn't enough, 
saying, look, this is what's going to happen at the resurrection. We're going to get incorruptible bodies, immortal bodies. That'll just be that final evidence of victory over death and sin and the power of sin, you know, which, which is death. So. Other other thoughts? Um, Tim, can we can we also say that basically, um, that is the motivation for for the whole of uh, the teachings of prophecy. Not that we get hooked on on trying to decipher the symbols in the scripture, Matt, trying to match them with. Um, things now in the present, uh, as many churches, as many pastors actually do or try to do, um, sometimes forgetting the, the that motivation that because of all of this, we see the sovereignty of God, God decreeing the beginning from uh, all the way to the end, that we are to continue to press on in, in, in the Christian life abounding in serving him etc yeah yep and you see that really every time uh future events are described that it's out you know that there's this present work present to the original audience present work that they're being that this revealing of the future is meant to motivate them to do. Even, you know, we discussed this with the book of Revelation, right? That the seven churches, what was going to motivate them to, to do what Christ specifically had told each one of them to do? Well, then they're given the, the future. They're shown what's going to happen. And so, yeah, I think you're exactly right, Robbie. Always look for this, guys. Um, you know, what is it that, what is the intended response God wants for us or from us in giving us these details of these events? Not to argue over, you know, even, even we might disagree on the timing of the tribulation or disagree even on the millennial kingdom. We're all agreed on the fact Christ is returning. We're all agreed on the fact that we're going to be raised from the dead. We're all agreed on the fact that we're having corruptible bodies. I believe all these positions hold to those views. And those are what's most significant. Um, you know, I, I have convictions about, you know, timing of certain things on, on these events. But I think we can all and should all rejoice together in the fact of, of the second coming the the resurrection bodies, the defeat of death, Satan. You know th those are all truths we we hold to together. Whether you're from covenantal or dispensational camps or pre-trib or post-trib or any of those things. Um. So keep keep the the bigger picture in view and follow the tone of the apostle, the original author. You know the 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 tone of praise to God for. Uh, victory over death and the call to serve without fail, without discouragement, without um, giving up. So that that's what we need to take away before we start arguing about timing and other things. I'm no, still going to might be helpful. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to share that it might be helpful also that as we look at all of these prophecies, even even the prophecies of um, the terrible things that are that that will happen um, even before the tribulation period, um, they they are all not only seen by God; they've been decreed by God. If the prophecies of Christ's return 
and the millennial kingdom are all decreed by God, then everything else, even the, uh, the bad events, some of which might be happening already at this time, somehow they're all decreed. And it just, just magnifies that God is in, in control even of the worst things that, 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 are, that can happen that we might experience even before the Lord turns. So nothing's by accident, and it's not these human kings and kingdoms um, that have the last say. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it's all decreed. We're kind of back to this, the theme of Daniel, as you mentioned before. Um. So yeah, even First Corinthians fifteen, Paul lays out kind of what's going to happen, um, with some detail. So that's a should be cause for praise and thanksgiving, uh, rather than arguments. Also, Pastor Tim, I also impressed me that. Um, those prophecies were really not intended for us to be um, be more occupied with what happened in the future because that will certainly happen but be more faithful on the present uh, the, that's how I see it in the Olivet Discourse where yep. Jesus challenged his disciples to, to be ready to yeah. Just do what they are supposed to be doing, rather than be, uh, be occupied. When will these things happen? Uh, it's it's a matter of even the son of man. Uh, uh, he mentioned that um, he didn't know the exam, but he challenges them to really be faithful. Be faithful. Uh, the parables are a reminder. Uh, that and begins the, the faithful servant. Uh, it's just a matter of preparing to meet the Lord. And well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, those things will come. It's just a matter of, and it's not for us to determine when, but for us to do what we are supposed to be doing at the present. Yeah, that's a great point. I think Jesus says more. After he answers the disciples' questions, he says more about how they need to respond. Um, all those parables and such. So that's a good, great point. Great point. All right, brothers, the time has has escaped us, so we'll have to. If if the uh, mystery that Paul described doesn't happen, uh, we'll meet together next week. Uh, or at least those of us who believe in the pre-tribulation uh, will be gone. The rest of you can meet, but uh, if it happens. But in any case, let me close this in prayer.